We have some things up our sleeves. <laughs> Hello and welcome to WMBU. We are so glad that you've decided to join us on this Friday night online. So Claire, what do you miss the most about meeting together in person for youth? Well, it's obviously different and I miss my friends a lot, but it's still good that we can have this time. Wow. Yeah. I'm really thankful, as much as Zoom calls can get annoying, I'm really thankful for technology that we can still meet all together and see each other's faces and still be in each other's presence, even if it's in a different way. It's still pretty cool. Claire, what do we have on the schedule tonight? Well, Dana, we're going to enjoy some teaching time and some worship, and then we're going to have a Zoom call where we're going to play some fun games and have small groups. That sounds like a blast. My goodness, do you know who's teaching tonight? Mm, Greg. <laughs> Greg, wow, we are in for such a treat with Greg today. Wow, I'm so excited. We definitely miss meeting in person, but definitely glad that we can still meet online. Well, I don't know what else <laughs> to say now. Oh, mm, okay, yeah. I'm going to pray, and then we will get on with this night. Dear God, thank you so much that we can gather um, tonight, gather to worship you in separate places. We know that um, you are with us wherever we are, and we thank you for that. I pray, God, that you would reveal to us um, new things about who you are, would we really be intentional about listening to your voice tonight? Would you go before us? Um, I pray that you would bless this night together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, buckle up and enjoy the ride. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm Natalie, one of the worship leaders, and we're so glad that you're here to worship with us um, at WB Youth Online. Um, just feel free to get comfortable, um, worship in whatever way feels right for you. And we're just going to be singing a song that a lot of us know, so just sing along, sing your heart out, and just feel God's presence moving in your own homes.
So here I stand This is Greg Reed, and I'm here to present uh, some stuff about the book of James, and I'm just so excited to be with all of you. Well, not with all of you, but virtually with all of you. And, uh, I, you know, I just got to start by saying I miss all of you, and uh, I really just am praying and uh, thanking God for all that uh, Brad has been doing and Renee and the rest of the youth leaders, the team. Uh, we're just grateful. And uh, if you haven't done so already, I'd encourage you to reach out and say thank you and uh, encourage these leaders that are praying for you and loving you. But here we are, on to the book of James. And I'm excited. I know that Brad kicked it off last week, but I get a big chunk, kind of the last half of chapter one and then most of chapter two. And uh, I'm excited about what's in this uh, book of James because really James is this guy that was a leader in the church and he had a lot of advice for all of us. And so let's just look and see what kind of advice we can gather out of James tonight. And tonight I wanted to start with calling it true faith. Uh, you know, it's interesting, this word faith, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we go. But faith is interesting because it's all about believing. But it's actually this hyper-confidence of believing because we're actually convinced that God is God, that he's real, and that he's going to do what he said he was going to do. And so when we uh, read his word, especially in the book of James, we're going to find out many things that he's called us to. So let's kick it off. Again, it's a big portion, and I'm not going to read all of it by any means, but I would encourage you to even write Write down right now James chapter 1 verses 19 to chapter 2 verses 26 and sometime after this you watch this uh, go read it and uh, check it out because there's lots of good stuff there but I want to start by highlighting in the first section in chapter 1 a specific verse and this verse in James 1 verse 19 to 21 says this understand this my dear brothers and sisters you must all be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to get angry you know, human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. 
for it has the power to save your souls. Well, you know, when I read that, I think of a couple of things. And the first thing I start to think about is actually another passage of scripture that you can go read sometime. It's called the parable of the four soils, or in some Bibles, it's called the parable of the the seed and the sower. But it's in Matthew chapter 13. You can check it out, verses 1 to 9. But when I read that, there's these four different types of soil. And the one soil that is really the best soil is this soil that has nothing else in it. It's deep, it's rich, it's fertile. And when God's word hits it, it has the opportunity to germinate, to grow, and to produce fruit. And, you know, the unfortunate thing is in this parable, there's three other types of soil where the seed, you know, it might germinate, it might start, but in many cases, it just can't grow. And, you know... We've got to make sure our hearts are ready to receive God's word. And so as we do that, I would invite you to just ask God, even tonight, to allow his word to germinate, to sprout, and to grow in the soil of your heart. So I just want to pray that really quickly right now. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you again that we can gather um, online, that we can be together, that we can be the church. But mostly, God, right now, we want your word, not my word, not anybody else's word, but your word to stick in our hearts. And I pray that where there's thorns or weeds or where the soil isn't deep, God, that that you would fix our hearts and that our hearts would be made um, like good soil, deep, rich, and ready to receive your word. So God, we just pray against anything that would hinder your word growing in us tonight. So lead and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's exciting, eh? And uh, I I just think, you know, one of the things where God really impacted me, because if we're ready to hear God's word, the soil has been like, like deepened. And we're talking about allowing God's word to really nurture in us. So we can't just hear it, let it go in one ear and then out the other ear. What we've got to do is actually allow it to, to, to get in deep. And that means to truly listen. And if you've ever heard me before, uh, it's like, listen to the sound of my voice, people. You got to actually listen, because if you're not listening, you won't hear. And this is what true faith does. It hears the word of God. It it, it gets in there. And for me, when I was much younger, when I was probably some of your ages, like when I was 13, 14, 15, and I used to have to travel. I lived in Toronto, and I used to take the subway downtown downtown myself, and I'd have to go out and about. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, the last subway train wasn't running, or I couldn't get a bus and I had to walk and I had to walk in some really weird places and uh, you know in Psalm 23 verse 4 it says you know that even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death we should fear no evil and I remember when that word of God started to germinate in my heart I really started to believe it and understand that God was caring for me and I remember these dark alleys in downtown Toronto that I had to cut through to get home and back to the subway station or or to wherever I was going. And uh, God really convicted me. He, he, he asked, Greg, do you believe me or don't you? And you know what? In, in this specific case, Greg, like you can have confidence. I am here with you. I'm walking beside you. You do not to, need to fear anything. And so I would walk through those dark alleys free, uh, free from any hindrance. I still had to be not stupid, right? I had to be safe and I I wasn't going to go down a dark alley where, you know, a drug deal was going on or something like that. But in this simple, just getting rid of the anxiety, getting rid of the fear and the confidence that came with God's word planted in my heart. And so can I invite you to actually believe in God in such a way to have such faith that we don't just like fiddle with it. We actually hear it. We listen to it, just like that verse said. And if we, we, we just take a look at that and we could be quick to listen and then just stop and allow God to speak to us and allow us just to get rid of the anxiety, the anger, the humanness so that we could receive God's word. That would be an amazing thing. So true faith, number one, here's the word of God. The next thing I want to talk about is, as we go a little further in this passage, is it says this right at the beginning of chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, so James is talking to the church. He's talking to those that believe in Jesus. How can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Oh, so what does that mean, right? Like, how can I claim to have faith, right, in, in Jesus 
If I'm actually holding one person above another person, if I'm, you know, this is like granting favors. If I, if I grant a favor to one person but not to another, that's actually not so good. So this is another teaching we want to look at. It continues in verse 8 and it says, Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's a great royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin and you are guilty of breaking the law. So this is what I think about when I read those verses. True faith rejects prejudice. And every time I see the word prejudice, I go to its root, prejudge. We can't prejudge people. True faith, belief in Jesus, actually causes us to not judge people and not prejudge them before we know them. And this comes out of the second greatest commandment, which Jesus quotes uh, to the Pharisees and stuff in Matthew chapter 22, verse 39. He says that the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. So I wonder, who is your neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Who is it that I need to love? Especially when God's saying, don't be prejudiced. Don't prejudge people. And so, you know, for me growing up, this was always fairly easy, right? This was the people that I thought I could get something from, right? So, so and so is fairly wealthy. So and so has a nice house. So and so has a pool. We can have a pool party there and all that stuff. And so we would kind of go, oh, you know, it will be nice to that person so that we can get the benefits of the resources and the money and all the things that they have. Um, unfortunately, I, I would be prejudiced against um, any of my friends, right? And, and they weren't actually somebody that I really, really loved. It was just I wanted to get something from them. And I wonder, uh, have you prejudged people? Have you put people into a higher bracket than they should be? Uh, or, you know, maybe even on the other side, have you prejudged somebody and you've actually stayed away from them? because you figure they'd take too much of your time, they'd suck too much out of you. And this is what we do sometimes, right? And true faith doesn't do that. God says we are to love our neighbors as we would want to be loved. And so, you know, I want to take a little moment here to pause. And I want to ask you to uh, take a minute, go find somebody in your house, go talk to somebody that's with you, or grab a piece of paper and write out the answer to kind of this next question. Who is it that you um, have seen uh, prejudge people? Or, or what prejudging experiences have you been involved with? What, kind of think that through. Where have you had prejudice against somebody? Where has somebody been prejudiced against you? Right? Write that down. And then I want you to ask this question. Who are the people that you think less of? Who are the people that you think less of. Okay, let's start the timer and we'll be back in two minutes.
All right, folks, I'm here with a very, very important announcement for our giveaway challenge this week. Now, this week's challenge is somewhat unique because there's not going to be one winner. This one has potential for there to be several winners. And really, to see what you guys are going to do, we're all going to be winners. So I come to you with a very important age-old question. What would you do for a Klondike bar? Jonathan, what would you do for a Klondike bar? Well... Okay, we're back. Hopefully you uh, had some good time by yourself or with somebody else or writing something down. But let's just recap really quick because I know these youth videos, they're hilarious, right? Like something funny just happened and I'm not even sure what it was, but that's okay. So true faith, just to recap, number one, here's the word of God. The word of God gets into that fertile soil of our hearts so that we can receive it and actually understand it. True faith also doesn't prejudge people. It doesn't um, prejudice itself against other people. And so those people we need to love. Love your neighbor as yourself. So let's move on to this third thing, which is really the biggest thing. And I'm going to do a bit more here. So with this, we want to start in James chapter 1, back in verse 22 again. Because in that first passage where we're talking about listening to God's word and hearing it, he also finishes that portion by saying this, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Wow, there's some action there. And you know, this is a bit um, polar opposite to what we always teach. You know, we don't have to work to get into God's kingdom. We don't have to do anything to receive the grace that God's got for us. However, once we have faith, once we've been received into God's kingdom, we're his kid, we're his child, and now we can't just listen to his words and go off and do whatever we want. We're actually part of the family. And so we've got a bit of responsibility to do as God calls us to do. And true faith is that confidence that what he's got for us to do is really, really good, and it's going to be awesome. And so let's just jump into chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it Dear brothers and sisters, that's you and me, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions, 
Like, what good is that faith? Because it's not doing anything. Can that kind of faith save anyone? And if you know me at all, and some of you don't, and come get to know me sometime, it'd be great. But if you know me, the goal, the goal is that each one of you, each one of your friends, each one of my friends, everybody in the world that God has created would come to know him and be coming um, into relationship with him so that they could be a son and daughter of the king as well. So we really look forward to that day. And this is the reason why we need to show this faith in our actions. It has to make a difference in the way that we behave. Let's move on. Still in chapter 2, now we're down to verse 17. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Do you get that? Your faith is useless unless it's producing fruit. And so remember we started with, we got to hear God's word. We got to listen to it. It's got to germinate. It's got to grow within us. And then we've got to get rid of some of those distractions like prejudice so that God's word can produce fruit. And this is the kicker because good fruit will come. These good deeds will come as that faith rises up. But we can't just say we believe. We've got to go for it. We've got to take a risk. Let's move right into verse 19 and 20 here. You say you have faith, for you believe there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Wow, that's a verse to unpack. And and if we think about it, you know, The demons aren't producing good fruit, but they're producing action because their belief is true. They know that God is true. They know that God is real and they tremble in terror. We don't want to be foolish. We want to see that our faith will produce good deeds. So let me talk about that a little bit. So the the key point here is that true faith leads us to something. It transforms into something. It transforms into action. Okay, again, I got to go back. I'm old now, but you know, I was 16 once and I remember just around my 16th birthday, I think it was actually on my 16th birthday, I got on a plane. I got to pause for a second. I can't wait to get on a plane again. (laughs) I love to travel. And if there's anything I miss in these COVID days, it's traveling. But someday, hopefully we'll be traveling again. But I remember getting on that plane at 16 years of age uh, and going to Spain. And I was going on my very first missions trip. And I was somewhat terrified because all of a sudden, I had been a Christian for a few years. I'd been going to church my whole life. And now I had to actually go to another country because of Jesus. And I had to talk to people about Jesus. And while I was there, uh, I had to speak in front of a group and they said, just talk about uh, something you've learned. And at the time I had really learned about this short little passage in Proverbs chapter three. And uh, it went something like this. You can look it up. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will keep your paths straight. That was an older version, so it might sound a bit different in the version you read, but that had sunk in for me. And so what I needed to do was I needed to take the words of God that were in me and put them into action. And so guess what? I hopped on a plane. I went with a bunch of other people to Spain and we put this into action because we trusted to God with all of our hearts. And we didn't, we didn't figure out, you know, exactly what we were going to do in Spain until we got there, but we couldn't lean on our own understanding. We had to acknowledge what he had for us. And guess what he did? He made our, he made the way, he made our path straight. And so God's word came true to life, but it didn't really come true to life until I put it into action, until I stepped out and took that blind step of faith, that risk to do mission. And you know what? Once you do it, it starts coming more naturally. It comes more naturally. And so all of a sudden, I'm the kid in youth group that is telling everybody about Jesus. And they're like, Greg, I already know about Jesus. I come to church youth group. But I'm like, well, then why aren't you transformed? Why aren't you changed? Why aren't you sensing what the Holy Spirit's doing? Why isn't God alive in you? Uh, Because I don't think 
Many of my peers had put God into action, had allowed their faith to be put into action. They weren't willing to take that next step. So I was the encourager. I'm the guy poking people all the time. So guess what? Eventually I become a pastor. It makes kind of sense, doesn't it? Then, as life went on, you know, sometimes I'd read in God's word and, and the, it just wouldn't, I wouldn't listen, I wouldn't hear it really well, and, and then I wouldn't put it into action. And I started getting fearful again. You know, I'd already beat the valley of the shadow of death. I was already okay with not having fear in my life. But then fear started to come back again because I all of a sudden wasn't hearing God's word again and I wasn't putting it into motion. And then people started getting sick. And I was on missions programs, and all of a sudden it's like, well, the Word of God says that if somebody gets sick and uh, they come to the elders of the church, you're supposed to pray for them. You're supposed to anoint them with oil and all that stuff. So we start praying for people. And, you know, I've, I've seen amazing things happen where we've prayed for people and, and their knees are hurting, right? They're, they can't walk anymore. And, and so we start praying and we go, you know, in faith, God, would you meet this person? Would you heal them? Would you allow them to continue to move forward in what you want them to do? And then, like, you forget about it. And a week or two later, somebody goes, you know, thanks for praying because my knees are totally better now. And uh, it's just cool kind of what happens. And so I'd encourage you that if, if, if somebody comes up to you and says, could you pray for me? Like, what do you believe? Go research the Bible. Go look and see what God's saying about that and listen to his word and allow it to germinate in your heart and grow. And then, you know, whether you love that person, whether you think that person's a bit goofy, whatever, get rid of the prejudice we're all the same in God's kingdom, right? Like he loves us all the same. And then pray. And you're going to see amazing things happen. You know, for me also, I, I've had this, many of you know, I've had this weird kind of life where every six or seven years I've switched jobs. And, and quite honestly, it hasn't terrified me much. It probably terrified my wife, Rosalind, a bit more than me every time I'd, I'd say, it's time to change jobs again. And, and we'd pray. And we'd ask God for direction. And God would speak either sometimes really clearly through Rosalind. She would just say something. She didn't know it was Jesus speaking through her. But all of a sudden I knew because she convicted my heart and God's word would grow. And then all of a sudden I'd, I'd know which direction to go and how to handle that job change. But you can't just sit back and not do anything. The, the stuff that God's breathing into you has to produce transformation which leads to action. And so, you know, later when you're hanging out together in the Zoom call, uh, you're going to have some questions to ask around that, right? Like, where is God leading you into action? And what's he calling you to by what he's taught you? And can I tell you this? Really importantly, don't believe anything somebody tells you. Believe what God tells you. Sometimes God will speak through Bradley Shirk. Sometimes, and you're going to hate this one, God will speak through your parents. Sometimes, God will speak through an old guy like me. And sometimes, God will speak through a younger sibling or a, str a complete stranger because his word, sure, comes out of the Bible. And that's the main place. And we've always got to check these other things with what God's word says. But when God's word gets in, when, when Jesus, the Holy Spirit, comes and sows this seed and it hits fertile soil, it's going to cause a transformation in your life. And that transformation will totally lead to action. It will lead to some act of faith, some good deed. And dare I say, it will feel risky. It will feel really, really risky in the moment. So I'm going to pray for you in a minute and then I'm going to get off this camera and you're going to go talk about this stuff. But here's what I want you to just remember. True faith. One, listens to, hears the word of God. And if you haven't done it yet, go and check out that parable of the four soils and take a check at where your heart's at. Is it the hard, rocky path? Is it the shallow soil? Is it the soil and, and for most of you, it's probably this one. It's the soil where there's all sorts of weeds and thorns growing. And those are the distractions, right? Those are the things of this world that um, just aren't of God. They're, they're just weird things that, you know, we shouldn't be listening to. And they choke out God's word. Second thing, true faith rejects prejudice. It rejects favoritism, prejudging people. And so we've got to take a check. 
every time we get that thing in our heart that says, eh, I don't want to talk to that person, I don't want to interact with that person, or on the other side, I want something from that person, I should go suck up to that person, uh, no, right? True faith isn't that way because true faith is connected to Jesus, right? He's the one that we have our faith in, not other people and not ourselves. So we hear the word of God, we listen to it, we reject prejudice, and the big one, action. True faith leads to action because otherwise it's useless. And there's going to be a day when we stand before Jesus and we, we're just called into account. You know, how did you do with what I gave you? And each one of you, as you've received Jesus, and maybe you haven't yet, and maybe you got to talk to Brad or your youth leader and, and, and make that decision towards faith. Um, I'd love to talk to you about it. I'd love, you know, to hear about that. If you're deciding that, please let us know. But if you've made that decision and you've got that faith and it's not active, be a little concerned. Because true faith, it's a living relationship with Jesus Christ it's a living relationship with the Holy Spirit who's present in your life. Do not squash the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Allow him to work in and through you so that the amazing things that God wants to do can happen. Because that's the way the church works. I'm going to pray for you and then uh, Brad's probably going to say something funny. So here we go. Father in heaven, thank you again for uh, your word. Thank you for the richness and the knowledge and the insight that you gave James as the leader of the early church. Thank you that there's all these tidbits in, in his book about how to live and how to move forward. And so God, we just pray in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, under the authority of God the Father, that you would transform us in such a way that our belief would be mobilized and that we would take those risks and take those next steps for you. God, I pray that you would bless all those that hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. <sighs> right. Crap. Greg said I have to do something funny. Honey, are you still watching The Office? <laughs> you just tolerate it. Someone's flushing the toilet. Anyways, thanks a lot, Greg. Actually, no, you did an amazing job. Seriously, that was awesome. I love what you were talking about when you were talking about how, like, true faith, genuine faith, uh, it brings fruit. It's fruitful. Um, in James 1... At verse 22, I love this. Like, the book of James is amazing, right? Like, he, he, he just says it how it is, right? James doesn't sugarcoat anything. In fact, he even gets a little sassy, which is part of what I love about it, right? He says in verse uh, 22, Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. Like, basically, he's, he's, he's saying you're, you're pretty dumb if you claim to have faith and yet you don't live it out. Or in chapter two, he says, you say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they shudder in fear, right? Like if we have faith, it has to be shown with the fruit that comes from our lives. Uh, it's springtime now. It's really beautiful out. And uh, as you guys know, one of my favorite things to do is to go out with my camera and do some birding because I'm a huge nerd. And uh, this past week, I've been getting out a lot because it's spring migration time and you get a ton of amazing tropical birds coming from like Central and South America. They migrate through on their way to Northern Canada and the Arctic where they breed in the summertime. Anyways, as I've been out birding this week, uh, one thing I've noticed is just that there are people out because it's spring, it's beautiful outside. And uh, as I've been passing by people, a lot of people say, hi, how's it going? Right? That sort of thing. But one thing I've realized, especially in this season, is that for some reason, young people in particular, I'm talking about my generation and Gen Z, we have like this tunnel vision. And when people walk by, it's like head down, 
no eye contact. There is no initiative to say hi or to even look at another person that you're passing on the street. Why is that? Like, what is it about just being young that you just think that as soon as someone says hi to me, oh, they're weird. Oh, they're hitting on me or something like that. Like, that's bogus. Like, James is talking about living out our faith. And for some reason, I don't know what it is about being young, we don't even say hi to people on the street. Like, what's with that? So I personally try to always go out of my way to say hi, how are you, to people that I meet outside on my walks. And this past week, I actually got to meet a new couple uh, to, the, to the area. Their names are Mike and Bridget. Uh, they were bird nerds too, met them birding. And I went out of my way to make sure that, you know, someone said, hi, how are you? Uh, found out that they're new to the area, so we got talking. And eventually it led to me just sharing that I'm a youth pastor. And I don't know what that will lead to, but in that moment, I was just trying to be obedient to where God was leading me, to share who I am, to live out my faith in a simple way, to just say like, yes, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. This is who I am. James is really challenging us to live this out, right? So I ask you, do your friends really know that you love Jesus? Do your friends know that you're a Christian? Why? Why might they not know this? When you think about the way you live your life, do people around you actually notice that there's a difference to the way you live your life compared to everyone else out there? Some really good questions for us to ask ourselves and to consider, hey, is there actually good fruit coming from my faith? Because if there's not, well, James called you dumb. You looked in the mirror. You forgot what you looked like when you walked away. It's useless to have faith that doesn't lead into action. So this coming week, how are you going to live that out? It's pretty hard right now because we can't really get out there as much. We're not at school. We're not at our workplaces necessarily. A lot of us are just kind of trapped at home. And so what does it look like to actually go out of your way to share your faith with others, to live out your faith with your actions? Maybe it means that you're saying something online via social media. Maybe it means that you are inviting someone to watch our youth program on Friday nights. Uh, we're hoping to do another Zoom games day soon. Maybe it means you're inviting them to that. Um, part of living out our faith genuinely means just to invite people to share the love of Jesus with those around us. Wherever God is calling you to, I'd actually love to hear about that. I'd love to hear about how you have acted out your faith. And then let's share those things together. So send me a message. Send me an email, write it on Instagram, send it to me there. I want to hear about how you have had experience living out your faith and what's happened because of that. What has happened when you've actually gone out of your way to share the love of God with someone else and to live out your faith in this world? Well, you guys, it's been an amazing night as it always is. We're going to head on over to our Zoom room now and play some games, have some small group discussion and just catch up and share our lives with each other. It's amazing being together tonight, you guys. God is good. Someone, one of you just said all the time, I'm sure. So, thanks for being together with us tonight, you guys. Mm. <laughs> I don't know what to say. How do I usually end these things? Mm. All right, we're done. You can, it's okay. I'm recording, but you can just interrupt. Three things. Slides not switching. <laughs> well, why is it focusing over there?